The 25th World Scout Jamboree in South Korea has been making headlines here and elsewhere as heat-related challenges force some teams, including those from the UK and the US, to depart from the camping ground in Semangam, Chalabukta province. So what were some of the challenges faced? What countermeasures have been introduced? And how are the rest of the over 30,000 scouts from more than 150 countries weathering the challenges? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. We start the work week this week with our panel of foreign journalists and their thoughts regarding some of the events here that made headlines elsewhere as well. For more, I have Jack Barton here in the studio with me. Jack, welcome back. It's a pleasure. I also have Nicholas Rocker with us. Nicholas, it's great to have you here. Good to be back. Right then, Jack, let's begin straight off with details about some of the challenges faced by the organizers of the World Scout Jamboree here in Korea. I think a lot of the challenges revolve around the location. So it's been described as reclaimed seabed or by some reclaimed wetland. Either way you look at it, it's a perfect place to get very muddy when you have heavy rains like we did recently, and also to get very hot and reflect a lot of heat when you have a heat wave like we're in at the moment. And also, of course, that is a natural environment for mosquitoes. Uh, so the kind of infestations that we've heard reported down there, again, so a lot of it reflects to the location. That feeds into other things like some of the spoiled food we've heard of, the moldy eggs, or perhaps the conditions uh, in the portable toilets and the shower blocks. And though that no doubt also relates to the fact there are only 70 cleaning crew on for, I've heard various figures from 39,000 to 43,000 people. So obviously with that number of support crew and in that environment, it's going to be a very difficult testing situation even if it's just a normal summer. But we haven't had a normal summer. We've had torrential downpour and now we've got a heat wave. Um, so all of that coming together to really create Terrible events that I would have to say, nonetheless, what we've heard anecdotally is a lot of the kids are still enjoying themselves. You know, they like being around lots of other young people. They don't really care about the conditions. But of course, for liability reasons, organizers, parents, scoutmasters, you know, they have to worry about these things. But I think the youngsters, by the sound of it, are still having a pretty good time. Right. And the government here, Nicholas, as Jack mentioned, they have since uh, expanded the number of cleaning staff, of course, at the uh, Semangam camping site. And that also being said, then, what other efforts or countermeasures have been promised or have been uh, put into action by the government as well as corporate Korea? We've seen uh, a number of, you know, emergency measures, emergency actions, such as, uh, you know, more than 100 air conditioned buses, uh, distribution of water, uh, sodium pill to try to keep the, the, the use, uh, the, the use hydrated, sun cream, uh, an ice cream company also giving uh, the kids one ice cream per day, more medical staff, of, of course, some portable toilets, more than 50 were, were deployed to the to the site. So we've seen a lot of, of different uh, measures. Also, uh, yeah, the medical staff has its importance because I've just crossed upon a, a few uh, British scouts in the subway and their legs were just infested by, by bug bites. So yeah, I think all those emergency uh, measures were taken, but there's only so much that can be done actually uh, because uh, as Jack just explained there's there's just a poor choice of location it would have been probably wiser to put uh, this this uh, event with 40,000 teenagers probably uh, on a higher location maybe somewhere else than uh, Cholapukdo that we know is a, is a very hot and humid re region in, uh, in in summer maybe closer to a forest with some natural shade so yeah there's, there's only so much that can be done, uh, actually, and uh, the, the real question is why was it hosted at this precise location? Right, and speaking about that, Nicholas, if you were to suggest some alternative activities for the scouts, given the weather conditions, apart from the heat as, as well as the typhoon that's coming uh, up, up later this week, what would you suggest? Well, I don't know what I will suggest, but I know that there's been a, a lot of different, uh, you know, alternatives that have been offered either by, uh, you know, Samsung offered uh, to to um, make the kids visit uh, uh, one of their semiconductor plants. Uh, Pusan has offered to uh, welcome 10,000 scouts, uh, scouts on uh, Hyundai Beach and other location. Uh, there's going to be a K-pop concert that was supposed to be yesterday night. I believe that's going to be in Jeonju uh, World Cup Stadium. So there's a lot of different activities, which what seems obvious is that you have to bring parts of those activities indoors 
um, because of the heat and because of the of the incoming typhoon and maybe some of the activities if some scouts are relocated in other regions could be at night i've seen that for some of the uk scouts that are now around seoul there's been some night trekking activities that have been suggested uh, i talked on the phone with some uh, french scouts uh, this weekend to just understand how they were coping with the events and they said that they were organizing some off camps you know activities such as tree climbing in the forest so with more shades that seems more bearable uh, for the kids or just you know a few days at the beach so i think it's gonna it's going really to depend and on where the scouts are being sent and uh, you know I hope the central government and the local governments can work together to find yeah some activities but as Jack said there's a you know thousands of kids together I'm sure they're going to be having a great time wherever they are. Right hopefully of course. Jack against this backdrop media reports claim that the Australian team has been bearing the heat wave and I quote like champs what more can you tell us? Yeah, I, they are going to pull out now, but not because of the heat, because of the typhoon. So they say events have overtaken them. They wanted to stay. The heat wasn't a problem. Um, they're not going home. They're relocating up to Seoul and they're going to see the Jamboree out just in a different location. But I, I think it's probably a similar experience for lots of uh, participants from hot countries. I mean, in Australia, this kind of summer is no biggie. If you're in Queensland, this is a normal summer. Even if you're down in the southern states, the humidity might be a little bit new, but the heat's certainly not. And, um, you know, you don't have any poisonous snakes down there. You don't have bullet. You know, we have ants in Australia the size of two finger joints when you go out camping that are everywhere and biting your feet. And the, uh, we have the mosquitoes. We have many other <laughs> insects. And so this is kind of, this is easy camping for them. Um, but I don't think it really comes down to the kids. Again, you know, even the kids from the colder countries are having a good time. It's just that the people organizing them, the scout masters, are used to this weather. So the Australian contingent bought lots of extra shelters. They bought lots of uh, sunscreen. They bought lots of beverages, you know, rehydrating beverages. They bought ice packs for cooling people down. They, ahead of time, they organized an air-conditioned bus so that when the groups had to move large areas, they could be bussed across in air conditioning. They did everything that they're trying to rush in now as an emergency measure. They already brought with them and had in place. And that's why hardly any of the Australian children have gone to the uh, clinics and probably not just Australia, probably a lot of other countries that are just used to this weather and came prepared for a hot summer uh, would be in the same situation just because they not because not they're smarter or tougher, just because they're used to it. Right, I see. Jack, I understand this may be a tough question, but based on what has been shared by the media thus far, what do you suppose could have been done better to perhaps avoid the current challenges we are seeing here? Look, if you ask a real estate agent, um, you know, what kind of house should I buy? What should I do? They say, don't know, that's the wrong question, is where should I buy it? It's location, location, location. We had a wonderful Winter Olympics here. It was very well organized, and there's a ton of facilities in beautiful alpine regions just waiting to be utilized by a large scouting jamboree. You've got these vast fields in these ski resorts that are currently closed down, not being used, lots of accommodation, lots of facilities in some of the most beautiful scenery in the world. Now, I'm just saying, you know, that's, for me, it's location. It's not how do you fix all the problems from a reclaimed seabed. It's like, why on earth in the summer, even if it wasn't going to be heavy rains, even if it wasn't going to be a heat wave, you knew it was going to be hot and pretty unbearable. Why not have it in an alpine location mm -hmm. at a site that has brilliant facilities that are mostly being unused? So I would say that was just the big mistake. I understand this plot of land was reclaimed ages ago. Lots of projects failed and there was kind of maybe a political need under the previous administration to use this land and to find some function. But unfortunately, in this case, I think politics got placed above a lot of fun and really good memories for the kids and the organizers who would come back with a very different impression of South Korea had they been in an alpine area. Right. Um, Hopefully think. organizers can make up for that. Mm. Uh, they have some time, of course. Uh, Nicholas, I believe three scouts from France made quite a bit of headlines for cycling 
from the French capital to South Korea. Could you tell us a bit more about their actual journey? Yeah, well, I was, uh, I was lucky enough to meet them when they arrived in, in Seoul to, to do a short interview uh, with them. So they started in January in Europe. They went through Europe through uh, the Danube River, one of the biggest river in Europe. And then their goal was to go through the Silk Road. So they, uh, they took one or two boats through the, the, um, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And then they, they arrived uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in Azerbaijan, then they did Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, all the mountains, Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan. Then they had to go through Russia, which was a bit of a, of a visa issue for them. But in the end, they managed to have a five-day visa to go through Russia and reach Mongolia, in which they were in deserts for uh, 2,000 kilometers. And then uh, from there, they managed to go into China, reach the, the city of Tallinn, where they, they hoped to get a, a, a ship, but uh, they were forced to take the only plane of their journey to land in Seoul. So yeah, they're, they're, it was really, you know, they had some, some great anecdotes throughout this journey. The, the, their main goal was to uh, show that it's possible to travel in different ways and eco-friendly ways. Also, they really wanted to uh, point out that it's necessary to, you know, live like the local live when you go to a country. They were trying to, to learn as many words of the local language as they could, uh, you know, share some experiences uh, with the local. So it was really touching testimony and, uh, and you know, it seemed like, a, like an important and a great moment for them. And now their, their, their wish is that for the next Scout Jamboree that will be in Poland in 2027, uh, some Scouts from either Asia or Africa try to do the same journey. So their, their goal is really to inspire uh, the, the use of the world and show them that yeah, it is possible to travel in other ways and maybe more respectful of the of the planet and of the local people of the countries you Right, you of through. course, good to know. Did you get a chance to ask them how they plan to travel back to France? They are going to travel back by plane because of time of constraint, of course. <laughs> uh, it seems it seems a bit long to do <laughs> six months in the right, bike of course, in the other I'm way. Sure, I'm sure. <laughs> Meanwhile, on a more somber note and beyond the Jamboree Jack, a series of shocking mm -hmm. Stabbings targeting random people here in the country have raised quite a bit of concern among the public here, of course. First, and for sake of our foreign viewers who may not be familiar with these uh, very shocking and disturbing incidents in recent days, would you like to tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of focus on the last week, but it really began last month back around, I can't remember if it was July 22 or 21st, but there was the first stabbing at a subway station in Seoul where one person was killed, three were injured. And everybody was shocked by that. And then last Thursday, we had this young man ram a car, first of all, into a group of people, injuring five people, and then going on a, a sort of a, you could only call it a knife-wielding rampage in the department store that connects to a, uh, a subway station, this is all down in Songnam, south of Seoul, uh, injuring another nine people. Now, one of those people uh, has since died, a uh, number of them still in critical condition. The next day, the government bringing in very tough laws. But within hours of President Yoon speaking, we have another stabbing, uh, this time of a teacher uh, by a man who alleges he used to be one of his students. We don't fully know uh, if that's true or not. And I haven't checked since last Friday, but the last time I checked, there'd been more than 50 threats online for further stabbings. Another man had been picked up at a big bus station in Seoul walking around with a knife online. He'd threatened to kill a police officer and then kill himself. Um, and it just seems to, you know, th this keeps on going and going. And it's not a knife attack, but we've just had a bomb threat at Jeju Airport. This is extremely unusual um, for South Korea. And of course, it has the nation very uneasy, particularly people here in Seoul. Um, many of them even scared to go out. And even though it hasn't all happened at subway stations, a big focus. People are a bit nervous to go down to subway stations at the moment. Right, we are. And Nicholas, speaking simply as a member of the public here then, for now, of course, how do you explain the recent spate of uh, brutal violence against the public? I mean, as, as Jack Man mentioned, the prevalence of such grisly crimes here in Korea has been rather low compared to other countries. Yeah, well, it's really hard to explain individual acts such as those that we've been, we've been witnessing in Korea. Uh, what we can say is that obviously there's been a, 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 a strand, a copycat uh uh, strand with people, you know, trying to copy acts that they've seen and, you know, uh, with, with a lot of online threats. But it's, it's hard to, to really explain how, uh, you know, different individuals decide that, you know, certain moment to do those those very violent and brutal acts. I think there's probably sociological reasons, maybe other reasons, but uh, it's 
pretty early to tell, and I think you need to have you know experts, uh, you know, working on those subjects, trying to identify why is there you know, such a such a rise in recent right. Weeks. Of course, yes. of course, Jack. Some, however, claim that perhaps lax criminal punishment here in the country is to blame. What do you say? I think that's a separate argument. I mean, you can certainly argue that people who go around stabbing people and you know might. Uh, should be given life imprisonment, and not uh, that's not really in a position to say that. Um, but that that's a separate argument as to will it prevent them. I don't think any of the people that committed these crimes that I know of had a prior record, had been in jail, released early, any of those sort of things that you might say. Okay, that's a condition that, you know, had they not been released, this might have happened. What I can say is that some of them definitely had mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And even though amongst the Organization of Economic and Cooperation and Development, South Korea ranks very low, almost down the bottom in terms of violent crime, it also ranks very low, almost down the bottom in terms of support for people with mental health issues. And particularly in the case of the, the guy who rammed the car into the people and then went on a stabbing, it's very clear that he has very deep-seated mental health issues. Police are yet to even get to the bottom of why he did it, not because he's not being cooperative, he is. They just say he's so incoherent, his paranoia is so deep, and when he talks, they can't even really understand what he's talking about. Now, he was diagnosed, didn't get the support that he needed, and you know, now, obviously, we look back and say, in hindsight, you know, it, it's obvious, but I would say the debate we need to be having right now in Korea is about mental health. It's about people who are deeply troubled, getting the kind of support that they need. And, you know, then we can have a talk about how long they should spend in prison or... But, yeah, I, I think it's the wrong emphasis right at the moment, an immediate, understandable... Um, you know, we always hear this and this kind of thing, but there should be a much greater focus, I believe, on mental health because we know mental health was a big part of this. Right. And in keeping that in mind, Nicholas, what do you propose perhaps to discourage such violent crimes here in the country? I mean, what does France do perhaps to better protect its public from acts of terrorism? So I think it's two different different topics. And, uh, I mean, I would su subscribe to what Jack just said on mental health. I think that's probably one of the deeply rooted causes of what we, we, we have been saying. Uh, what, what a country can do to prevent those, those individual actions, first of all, could be to you know, limit access to weapons, which is done pretty well here in Korea. I mean, we can only you know, imagine with fear what could have happened if some of the people had handgun or semi-automatic weapons. So, I mean, this is one thing that a country can do. Uh, here, it's, it's, it's really different because we're talking about knives. We're talking about people that, you know, as Jack also explained, with, uh, took his own car to, to, to run people over and you cannot prevent that. Uh, so um, there's only so much that, that you can do. We've seen police investigation uh, tracking online threats, uh, more than 40, I believe, mostly of them being uh, young uh, people. So that's, of course, uh, you know, information is, is vital in those situations in order to prevent. Uh, also, I mean, yeah, the, the police has been taking measures going on site, on location with weapons in order uh, to prevent, you know, uh, any attacks that were uh, that were posted online before. If you talk about terrorist attack, it's a different, it's a different topic because uh, we're talking about organized crime when it comes to terrorist attack, uh, sometimes even funded by uh, people that are in foreign countries. So you need to track the money, you need to track the weapon, you need to, uh, you know, uh, identify the network and try to, uh, yeah, be sure that people won't, uh, won't act and, uh, you know, to, to try to find solutions uh, prior to the event to identify the, the persons. Most of the time, some of them have criminal record or have been in prison. If it, it's the case, often in France, the people can get radicalized uh, in prison. So it's it's a, a different uh, matter, I would say. But what has been uh, very, uh, you know, uh, in France, what happened is that there's been a lot of military people in train station, in airports, uh, in front of churches, in key uh, areas, which creates a situation of, of tension, actually. But we've become quite used to it, I would say. I'm not sure Korea is there uh, yet because this, this is really recent. And as I said, it's a different matter. But that has been one of the of the solution in a way offered by the French government. I don't think it's an ideal one. But in case of, you know, uh, when the when the threat is too big, it is one of the uh, solutions the governments have been using. So Right, of course. And while the authorities debate over ways to respond to such uh, greasy crimes, Jack, here's a tough question for you. 
Does media coverage of such crimes, Jack, do you suppose, do these, such media coverage encourage copycat crimes? We, we know that it does. Um, there's been extensive studies on whether crimes promote copycats. And yeah, it does, undoubtedly. In Australia, we had a case of somebody putting pins in fruits in the supermarket, and then within months, there were dozens of other cases, and turned out to be dozens of other people doing it. They never would have thought to have done it. Um, but does that mean the media shouldn't cover it? Obviously, if there are pins in fruit, you should cover it because it's, a, it's an awareness issue that people need to know. And the other thing is media is a very broad word these days. All three of us have had media training, extensive media training, uh, to filter information and to be responsible. But also called media is just the video blogger or someone writing something on the... And in a lot of people's minds now, it's the same thing. So if... If the mainstream media didn't cover it, then the information's going to get out. It'll get out through exactly the kind of sources that are more likely to promote copycat. And also then there'd be distrust of the mainstream media because, oh, why aren't you telling us about? So it, it is a very difficult balancing act. The only thing you can do is report on these things with a great sense of responsibility. And the responsibility is, of course, why did it happen? How can it be prevented? Focusing on issues like mental health and... Um, yeah, but it, does it, you can't deny that. Yes, it does cause um, copycat cases. Right, and keeping in mind what Jack has just said, Nicholas, we're going to stay with the philosophy, of course. Very briefly speaking, what is responsible reporting for you as a journalist? Well, I think it's only natural to always ask yourself, is what I'm reporting on useful? What interest does it have to the, to the public? And I think in some situations, uh, the, this importance is, is really enhanced. I'm going to just take a few examples of what happened in France because we're talking of terrorist attack. In, in 2012, there, were, uh, there was a terrorist rampage in the, in the southwest uh, of France and uh, the terrorist was tracked and, and found and he was locked in his apartment and he stayed locked in his apartment for 32 hours. And there were some medias that were live streaming in front of the, of the neighborhood, giving information on what was going on, what were the movements of the police, how many people were, were uh, how many you know, police forces went on the ground. And of course, we can only assume that the terrorist himself was, uh, was watching uh, live what was happening. So of course, in those kinds of moments, probably the priority is to uh, cooperate with the with the police. Try to not prevent, uh, you know, uh, the the police uh, job, and and try to to be sure that all the information that you put out there are, uh, you know, are first of all useful to the public and not hurting uh, the the job of the police. Right, of course, not compromising their safety then. For sure. I see. All right, Nicholas. As always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts today. Same. And Jack, as always, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Right, well, the World Scout Jamboree is poised to end this coming Saturday as initially planned and national as well as regional authorities, religious organizations and corporate Korea are coming together to ensure a safe and meaningful event. Thank you for watching. See you same time tomorrow. That is Tuesday.